Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are back with DC Comics, actually. It's been a little while since we covered anything from DC, and in this instance, Damian Wayne, also known as Batman's son, also known as Robin, basically faces off against the world and defeats some of the deadliest people, or actually fights some of the deadliest people in existence, which is amazing. This story is ridiculously phenomenal. So, what this does is it initially picks up with Batman and the Bat family actually on the hunt for Damian, because he simply just disappeared. Now, this is one of the things to know. Given how predictable prodigious Damian Wayne's training is, both as part of the League of Assassins due to the fact that he was basically raised by Talia al Ghul since Batman didn't know that he had existed for just years on end, as well as the training that he gained from Batman once Bruce Wayne learned that Damian was alive and was his son, and then brought him in basically as Robin. When this kid wants to disappear, he will disappear. Like, he will vanish. He knows exactly how to do that stuff. And we end up finding out that what he's actually doing is fighting in an underground cage match against a guy by the name of King Snake. Now, King Snake Snake's appearance here is both important and unimportant at the same time, in the sense that if Robin or if Damien can defeat King Snake, the hope is that he'll get some kind of passage to what's called the Lazarus Tournament, which is basically Mortal Kombat in the DC Universe. But the other reason why King Snake being here is kind of cool is because Damien is intentionally fighting this guy. Now, one of the things to know is that this story comes off the heels of Tom King's run on Batman. So Damien trying to sneak into Gotham City, even though he was told not to do so, by Bane, and with Bane having uh, Alfred prisoner, that Bane basically told the Bat family, if any of you enter the city of Gotham, I will kill Alfred. Damien, in his recklessness, defied that order. He actually got to the mansion, but he was allowed to get there, and then once he arrived, Bane made him watch as Bane killed Alfred. And so Damien's basically been haunted by this experience ever since. But in a lot of ways, going after King Snake is basically a way to get revenge on Bane, because the entire basis behind King Snake's character is that at some point, in time, he got to Santa Prisca, and as a mercenary, he committed crimes against the government, but also slept with a woman at the prison, which basically means that Bane is the son of King Snake. But as a result of that, it's a way for Damien to, like, indirectly get his revenge on Bane. But once Damien defeats this guy, he ends up basically leaving, hoping that this will earn him some kind of a passage to the Lazarus Tournament, but along the way, we end up finding out that, like, Damien is basically reading manga, which I'm sure a lot of fans of DC Comics are going to to love. Kind of a fun fact, I'm getting back into manga for the, for like, actually not even getting back into it, I'm getting into manga for the first time ever. I'm reading Spy Family, which I've heard was really, really good, but it's kind of cool to see that Damien is like into the whole manga scene. Uh, I don't know if that was a long-standing element of his character or not, but the other part of this, and probably one of the more significant parts of this, is that he's kind of haunted by the ghost of Alfred. Not literally. It's not literally Alfred's ghost who's hanging over him. It's really more of his guilty conscience, is really what it is. The fact that he's haunted by the fact that his actions are what directly led to the death of Alfred. And so, in a lot of ways, it's his subconscious mind speaking his concerns to him that his ras uh, rational mind is trying to simply ignore, trying not to focus on. But ultimately, because of his actions in facing off against King Snake and defeating him, he's basically granted passage to the Lazarus Tournament. And in doing so, once he gets to this tournament itself, it happens on Lazarus Island. Now, the funny thing about this is there's only maybe a couple people right off the bat who seem to indicate that they know who Damien is. The first one is, of course, Ravager, who, those of you guys who, who followed our coverage on uh, Christopher Priest's Deathstroke run, she's basically the daughter of Deathstroke, and she's kind of being brought in and has been a part of his team for quite some time. Uh, she's actually there for a mission of her own. But then you also have what's essentially Respawn. Now, we don't know anything about Respawn. This is a wholly new character that's being introduced here. But there are a couple things that go on. One of the first things that happens is you have a woman who really is a new character here being introduced as Mother Soul, who, if those of you guys who followed Mortal Kombat, think of her as like the Shang Tsung of this story. It's basically what she is, right? The one that's essentially leading the tournament. Now, she has her own motivation. She has her own scheme for why she's doing what she's doing. But the thing behind this is she says that there are essentially rules to this tournament. Now, of course, Damian Wayne, ever the headstrong and kid who just goes and does his own thing, basically says like, all this chit chat's boring as hell. Are we here to talk or are we here to fight? And so immediately he gets into a fight with Flatline, one of the other contestants 
happens here and Flatline rips his heart out. She literally kills him in the first issue. Damian Wayne dies. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but she rips his heart out in, in like the first issue and Damian Wayne dies. Like just like that and it's kind of it's kind of nuts right but of course he ends up recovering due to the capabilities of the lazarus pits right he's basically able to heal and then he's restored and when that happens there's a couple things to know one as it's indicated here there does not seem to be any temporary insanity that damian wayne undergoes due to exposure to the lazarus pits so perhaps it's something else that's basically leading him to being healed i mean it's kind of how they work right nobody can actually die on the island now the reason why i say that is that for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with the lazarus pits these are basically a source of healing that exists in the dc universe on earth that people who are put into the lazarus pits can basically almost even be resurrected from the dead depending on how long they've been dead for but what it does is when a person re-emerges from the lazarus pits more often than not they usually go insane not always but they usually experience just temporary insanity as a result of the effects of the lazarus pit and then once they're able to kind of come back to normal they just sort of go forward from there but what ends up happening is Ravager meets with Damien and says, okay, there's a few things you have to know here, right? Before you just flew off of the handle and decided to fight, uh, fight Flatline and were ultimately killed, that the rest of the, of the situation was explained to us. That the way this whole tournament plays out is that you basically have three lives. Everybody has to die one time. When that happens, then the actual tournament begins. So in the time between basically when they arrived on the island and when everyone's died once, which you can only kill a person one time before the official start of the tournament, between those moments, it's more of like a series of sparring matches to kind of size up your opponents and see what they're capable of. Once you die a second time, you come back a third. When you die the third time, your soul stays on the island and you never come back to life. So you permanently stay dead. Now, again, we don't know exactly why this is the case. We'll find out, you know, over, over the, the Robin run, but it's a really, really cool element because following that, when Damian Wayne already being down one life, essentially nobody can kill him anymore. His death was exceedingly high profile everybody saw it happen so people can't really kill him i mean they could but they'd be violating the rules if they did and the indication here is that violating the rules is a very severe punishment and so as a result of that damian wayne of course goes out and just starts attacking all these different people he kills a whole bunch of them kind of putting on his powers for display and really letting people know what it is that he's capable of but beyond that you have ravager who basically says okay with all these people here there's a few that you need to worry about right the first one you need to worry about is basically respawn right she says he's new that he's a piece of work that his moves are chaotic and they're undisciplined but he's exceedingly dangerous so in a lot of ways respawn is very similar to damian wayne in the early days of damian's comic book appearances before he learned finesse from batman the next one is xxl right who basically has an entourage that you know cheers this guy on which seems to kind of piss everybody off but beyond that he seems to have super strength of course you have flatline and we'll actually learn a lot more about her relatively soon and then you have black swan who's kind of like a ballerina arena right she you know death is her is her art as is essentially described but what ravager says is the biggest person and the most dangerous person that damien has to worry about is connor hawk now we don't know exactly what's going on with connor hawk's character what we do know is that for the most part when it came to connor hawk uh before the events of really like new 52 and dc rebirth and all that kind of stuff that connor hawk is the son of oliver queen and that his origin to you know the the degree to which we will get it over the course of this particular video seems to kind of fall in line relatively close to the original origin that he had back when he first appeared in DC Comics. But the thing about this is Connor Hawk is a, he has a huge following for people who love Green Arrow. And so I imagine for those fans who are reading this story and it's like, Connor Hawk is a legitimate threat and you need to be worried about him. They're, like a lot of those fans are probably just like, yes, like Connor Hawk is legit. The other caveat to this though, and what's so interesting about this is that Connor Hawk is working with the League of Assassins. And so it's kind of interesting to see why it is that these guys are all kind of working in unison. Well, it's really more the League of Shadows than anything else, but it's basically that the League of Shadows basically brought him. Now, here's one of the things that I want to explain here. So in DC Comics, you have the League of Assassins, then you have the League of Shadows, and then you have the Lazarus League or the Lazarus Tournament, whatever that is, right? The League of Lazarus, if you want to call it that. Originally, it was the League of Assassins, and that's all you had. You had Ra's al Ghul, his League of Assassins, and they were just the 
ninjas that would face off against Batman every so often. The way this worked in DC Comics is that because of the popularity of the League of Shadows in the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, the League of Shadows was rolled into DC Comics. And so the League of Shadows are led by Lady Shiva, and they're basically a splinter group that broke off of the League of Assassins. For the League of Lazarus, if you want to call that the Lazarus League, they're also a splinter group, but this is when they're being introduced, and we don't really know anything about them yet. So over the course of this, we'll basically learn about the, the, the Lazarus League, League of Lazarus. We'll learn about Lazarus. We'll just call it that. It just makes things easier if we refer to it that way. But one of the things that happens, and it's really kind of Connor Hawk's abilities being put on display, this guy is fast. I mean, he is fast, he's accurate, and he is ridiculously deadly. So he doesn't feel like the offspring of Oliver Queen. He feels like, like Damien 2.0. In a lot of ways, it's what he feels like. But at the end of the day, what you have is this kind of continued tour from Ravager, who takes Damien Wayne basically to the uh, to the barracks, right? To where they all crash at. And she's like, this is where you sleep. Now, no one can attack anyone else here. This is the one place where everything is a safe haven, right? So nobody can try to kill you or anything along those lines. But the cool thing about this is that what you end up having is this moment where Flatline and Damian Wayne just kind of talk to each other for a little bit because Flatline's the one who killed him. So at the very least, there's a bit of curiosity between the two. And in fact, they have this kind of moment where they basically go to explore the island as any young kids would do. And they discovered this enormous Lazarus pit that sits at the heart of the island. And there's some cloak and dagger discussion from like Mother Soul, but we don't really know the ins and outs of it, right? It's saying things like it's still too unstable. We need to feed it more if we want to get the results we're looking for Mother Soul. It's just those cloak and dagger discussions, right? We don't really know the significance of it or or any of that. We simply just know this whole thing kind of seems to be their whole shtick, right? This whole Lazarus pit is their whole thing. Again, we don't know the specifics of that. But the cool thing about that is you have this moment where basically Damian Wayne goes to leave and is ultimately taken by surprise by Ravager. And that's one of the things where Ravager's like, okay, look, I get that you're, you're exceedingly capable, you're a great fighter, and nobody, you know, anybody would be stupid to say that's not the case, right? You're clearly one of the best fighters in the world, but you're also headstrong and you're reckless. And I can teach you a few things, but Damian Wayne really looks largely at the fighting capabilities of Ravager. And it's just kind of like, you're not on my level, right? Like you're just not where I'm at. And so I'm just not too worried about you. There's nothing you can really teach me. Now that's the case when it comes to Damian, because the response of Ravager is no, yes, I can, right? Like you need to come with me. You need to learn what it is that I have to teach. And what she says is that this is your, you know, you, you, with when it came to like the League of Assassins, and when it came to Batman, you were taught how to fight. You were taught stealth. You were taught guile. You were taught all those things. What you were never taught is how to make friends. And so literally like how to have fun is what you're going to learn because she takes him to a part of the island where despite the fact that all these people are basically supposed to fight to the death, that they're all like playing video games and like partying and all that kind of stuff. Now, one of the first rules that was set down by Mother Soul is that there is no fraternization here because that fraternization will actually lead to fighters being unable or unwilling to fight each other to the death, right? I mean, this tournament's going on like once every 100 years. So it's not like a brand new thing that just launched. It's been going on for a while. But one of the funny things here is that as soon as, as, soon as Damian Wayne shows up, you know, XXL is like, who brought the narc, right? And like everybody else, like they just, they're not really taking to him. And a lot of you guys who are fans of Damian Wayne, you know, it's kind of his thing to just sort of be a dick. Nobody likes a guy who's a dick. So that's why like people just don't really, don't really seem to be that interested in him. But what they do respect is, is what any young person respects. Shows of bravado, right? Like, you know, kind of thumping their chest a little bit, that sort of gorilla chest beating that kind of goes on, that sort of thing. They can sort of respect that just given their own natures and what they're about. So while he goes around and tries to make friends, but everybody kind of blows him off, that one of the things that happens, that he takes these, these little daggers and he puts his hand on the table and then he throws the daggers down and they all land in between his fingers at the exact same time. And just that display of accuracy just blows everyone's mind. Mind. They're just like, holy cow. Like, all right, man, this kid's all right, dude. Like this kid's got it. Because initially they thought that he was all show, that there was nothing to him. But showing off that kind of display of just accuracy and capability, people are like, okay. The problem with this is that Damian Wayne lives under the shadow of Batman. So the longer they talk to Damian Wayne, the more they all start telling their stories about how they all got beat up by Batman. And that's what it turns into. It turns into this kind of outward display of like, hey, Damian, you're cool, but like your dad's cool. 
cooler. And so ultimately, while they're all telling their stories and hanging out, Damien just basically walks away, and then he ends up coming across Connor Hawk. And as the two of them start talking, they actually kind of share this bit of a, of a connection between each other in the sense that their relationships to their father are very, very similar. That while Bruce Wayne didn't necessarily abandon Damien Wayne, it was more that Bruce Wayne just didn't even know that Damien existed, that Connor's father, Oliver Queen, did basically abandon him, right? That Oliver Queen learned that his wife's Sarah, Sasha, that she was pregnant with his son and he held him like once and then walked away. And that was basically it, right? So it was a lot of those instances where they're just kind of coming to grips with their relationships to their dad. Now, again, the DC rebirth origin of Connor Hawk has not been fully fleshed out yet. It will be. But the reason why that's important is because we don't know if the origin of Connor Hawk as it exists now is the same origin as before the events of DC rebirth, if it's the new 52 or whatever, because remember with everything going on in DC comics, right? Right now, Dark Crisis and all that kind of stuff, the reconciliation of the pre-New 52 universe and the existing New 52 universe, that's all being reshuffled yet again. So you're likely going to start seeing people getting new origins that are going to be updated post- dark crisis, whatever this is, right? If they decide to go that route, I'm not entirely sure they will, but characters like Connor Hawk are a little bit murky in the DC landscape. But the thing about this is that while Connor is told by the League of uh, the League of Shadows, do not associate with people here and certainly not with him, that because he owes them some kind of a debt in the sense that they basically saved him and they took care of him when seemingly nobody else would, again, we don't really know the ins and outs of that, that it leads to Connor Hawk being told by the League of Shadows, kill him, right? And they're not one, like they're not supposed to be fighting at night, and two, they're not supposed to keep on fighting after one person has already died. But the result of this is that Connor Hawk does it anyway, because there's no one here to tell him no. There's no one here from Lazarus to like oversee what's going on and to tell him you're not supposed to do that. And so ultimately Connor goes after Damien and where Damien faces off against Connor and is kind of able to hold his own momentarily in the end, Connor's just too fast and he's too capable. He gets the upper hand on Damien and then literally cracks his back and then throws him over the, uh, throws him over the cliff, which is, a really, really cool moment because it's kind of like Damian Wayne sort of getting his own Bane moment to a degree. But when he's thrown over the cliff, instead of being dashed on the rocks below and dying, he's basically whisked away. And we end up finding out that he's taken to the location of Ra's al Ghul. That the reality here is that him being brought to Ra's al Ghul was done by virtue of his pet, Goliath. Now, Goliath was like the pet of Damian Wayne. And in all honesty, Goliath kind of took a back seat after a little while. We didn't really know exactly where he went to, but it's cool to see that like the two of them were reunited, right? Because like him and Goliath were like best friends and Goliath loves Damian Wayne. So it's cool to see that Goliath is still kind of keeping an eye out for, you know, his master to a degree, I guess you could really call it that. But it's just kind of this really, really cute moment because it's one of those instances where you kind of get a, a momentary reprieve where you cut through all of like the super seriousness of Damian Wayne. And you remember like, he's still a little kid, right? Like he is in a lot of ways, just still a kid. And that's one of the best elements about Damian when DC Comics, when he's written right in this instance, Joshua Williamson is the one that's writing it, it's one of those great little moments because you get to see like the child part of Damian Wayne. It's why I loved the Super Sons comic so much, which by the way, we might start covering some Teen Titans stuff, right? Because the Teen Titans comics are just good old fun. But the thing about this is that Damian Wayne, basically meeting with Ra's al Ghul, the question that he asks is like, where have you been all this time? Now, the answer to this question actually comes from another comic called Batman and the Outsiders, and is actually kind of a follow-up to a plot point that was made in the main Batman comics, which was the basis behind the formation of the League of Shadows, that Ra's al Ghul had come to the belief that humanity was ultimately going to destroy the world. And so what Ra's al Ghul wanted to do was form a group called the League of Shadows as a splinter group of the League of Assassins that would basically help him achieve world domination. Lady Shiva was put in charge of it, and then Lady Shiva turned against him. And so in Batman and the Outsiders, Outsiders, it was basically Batman and Orphan and like Black Lightning and all that kind of stuff. And they all basically teamed up against Ra's al Ghul and they ultimately defeated him. Um, we might cover that at some point. It was a 17 issue run. It's not overly lengthy. It really kind of feels like a maxi series plus a few more issues, uh, but it's a pretty cool story. It's, it's, it's certainly worth a read, I think. It's pretty solid, but uh, that's ultimately where Ra's al Ghul has been ever since. Just kind of biding his time, preparing for this war that he's going to launch, which is actually called Shadow War. And that's the story arc that I think just 
recently finished in the Batman comics. So really a Batman, Robin, and Deathstroke crossover. But the thing about this is that uh, with that kind of information being given to Damien, Damien comes to the belief that Ra's al Ghul is the one that basically initiated this whole tournament. He's the one that brought Damien here and all that kind of stuff. But the response of Ra's al Ghul is again, he's just kind of laying low for the moment. And the reason why he comes to this place, this island, is because it allows him to look out into the stars. And that provides a kind of background motivation for why things unfolded in the uh, Batman and the Outsiders story. That for Ra's al Ghul, it's not world domination just for the sake of world domination, that he genuinely cherishes the world, that he genuinely values the world in which they live. And seeing humanity destroy it through a variety of different things, that creating the League of Shadows and trying to conquer the world was his way of trying to save it from like the stupidity of humanity. And so it's one of those things where he's just kind of been in the background ever since. But what's bigger than that is he tells Damien, like, like you have so much turmoil, right? Your heart is full of rage, way too much for a child that's so young. What you need is to learn to calm your heart. And what you need is to learn how to truly fight as somebody, not someone who fights, not someone who takes every single attack and uses it to their advantage, right? Attacks on every single opportunity. That's what you were trained and that's what you were initially taught. But what Batman's been trying to teach you and what I want to teach you here is just because you can strike at a certain moment doesn't mean you need to strike at a certain moment. You need to learn the art of how to attack properly. And so that's kind of what he teaches him, right? He teaches him not really any particular fighting style, but more how to take his fighting style to the next level. I mean, he does teach him some enhanced fighting techniques and it's kind of cool to watch Goliath training alongside them. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I absolutely love that moment. But ultimately he ends up leaving the purview of Ra's al Ghul and travels to Corto Maltese. And this is one of the coolest moments in the story because when he gets there, there's a couple things that we learned that had happened while he had been gone. The first is that Ravager had been killed by respawn. So she's already down one life. So when she died, basically she was resurrected, but that leads to the official start of the tournament. And so really it's the tournament's going to start with or without Damien, but he better get there in time. Otherwise he automatically forfeits. So the thing about this is that once Damien's at Corto Maltese, what he's looking for is this book that belongs to the priest of Lazarus, which seemingly contains the plans of what it is that Mother Soul is looking to do with this tournament in the first place. Because at the end of the day, as much as he wants to win this tournament, it's also a case he wants to crack. What's going on with this whole thing, this tournament, Mother Soul, and all that kind of stuff. But as he's there, uh, ultimately we end up finding out that when he'd been taken out by Connor Hawk and nobody knew where he was, that Ravager had contacted Red Hood. And when she did, Red Hood got a hold of the rest of the Bat family, minus Batman, and they've all basically responded. And you get this amazing moment where they all basically track him down and they all start trying to apprehend him in order to bring him in. And of course, Damien overpowers the entirety of the Bat family with the exception of Batman. Now, this is one of the cooler moments here. And the reason why I say that is that anybody who's a fan of Damian Wayne will tell you, yes, Dick Grayson's really, really cool. Dick Grayson's really, really awesome. He was the original Robin, right? He's always gonna hold a special place in everybody's hearts. That yes, Tim Drake is really awesome, right? He's, a, you know, every bit as smart as, as Bruce Wayne is and is capable. Um, that Red Hood is like the vigilante. He's like, what if Batman met the Punisher and like that's Red Hood, you know, that kind of a thing. But when it comes to just fighting technique, Damian Wayne is above them all. And it's awesome to see that, right? It's awesome to see that kind of being recognized here that Damian Wayne is the best fighter out of every member of the Bat family. And so the real kicker about this is that ultimately where, where Damian Wayne ends up being caught up to by Nightwing, that unlike the other members of the Bat family who are trying to like capture him and bring him in, that Dick Grayson's just kind of like, you're trying to find your way. And I respect that. I respect that you're trying to find your way and you're trying to do your thing. You have a mission here. And this is a fight that you need to fight on your own. So what he does is he presents him with one of his batons. He gives it to Damien and says like on the baton itself, it says versus the world that the reason why this matters is when Dick Grayson first struck out, right? when, he, when he first became Robin and then started doing his own thing as Nightwing, when he struck out on his own, that Alfred presented him with this baton and saying like, you can conquer the world, right? It's you versus the world. And it was a ceremonial thing that was given to, to Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson is passing that on to Damien Wayne. The reason being is twofold. The first is because Damien Wayne is currently the Robin. Robin in the Bat family, right? You have other members of the Bat family, but in terms of who's occupying the role of Robin, that's Damian Wayne, a role that was once occupied by Dick Grayson. But the other part of this is that during the instance when you basically had Bruce Wayne, who was believed to have been dead following the events of Final Crisis, when he was actually time displaced by Darkseid and his Omega sanction, that Dick Grayson temporarily became Batman and Tim Drake became Robin. That means they share a bond that nobody else has, right? There's no one else out there in the Bat family that has a same kind of bond with Damien that Nightwing does. And so that's the other reason why Dick Grayson is 
getting to him. It's quite literally passing on the mantle, which is kind of un has unofficially been done in DC Comics several times over the years, but it's a very ceremonial moment and a very personal moment that's going on here. And so ultimately Damian Wayne just kind of breaks down in front of Nightwing and it was like, I, I was there, I saw Alfred die. And it's the first time that we've actually seen Damian Wayne break down like this since the death of Alfred. He's kept that barrier up, right? Kept that wall up, kept that part of himself just hidden away from everyone else and has been trying to come to grips with it in his own way. But the truth about, about Nightwing is he says, I know. And that's when, when Damien's just like, you know, death has been a part of my life since I was born. But with Alfred, I didn't get it until I heard the snap. Damien has always killed people, right? He, he did that when he was part of the League of Assassins. He stopped doing that when he was being trained by Batman. But, but death is not an uncommon thing to him. The death of Alfred was the first time he experienced the death of someone he loved, the death of someone he genuinely cared about. And that's when he truly realized the impact of death because Alfred's not there. It's not as though Alfred just sprung back up and was like, man, we almost escaped, you know, or we almost, we almost bit the bullet, you know, good thing that whatever it was that happened, happened and kept me from dying. That like Alfred's dead and gone. And it's Damien coming to grips with the reality of what it truly means to lose someone you love. And so ultimately that's when Nightwing, right? You know, Nightwing says, you know how many times I ran away from home from Bruce and Alfred? More than I can count. For a long time, I was Batman's sidekick or the leader of the Titans. It took a bit for me to figure out who I was was away from that. And when Damien asks, why are you telling me this? The response of Dick Grayson is, Tim Drake, right? Stephanie Brown, Jason Todd, we're all Robins to Bruce first, but you were my first Robin. Not only that, you are Bruce Wayne's son. You're his biological son. The rest of us, we're all just adopted, right? But like everybody else, we were Robins for Bruce Wayne first, right? You were my first Robin. But the statement of Dick Grayson here is, don't run. Right, like this is your story. This is you figuring out who you are, what you're about. You have to embrace this. So go forward and fight in this tournament. Do your absolute best and wherever it takes you, takes you. And so following that, once he arrives back to the tournament itself, the whole thing begins. And Mother Soul says like, this is our time, right? It's our moment to fight. Let the tournament begin. And so what you get is you get round one, right? Robin versus Blue Shrike. And of course, Robin overpowers this guy quite readily, right? Damien takes this guy out with a quickness and literally everybody else gets taken out very very fast i mean like for the most part the the the, the herd is thinned very quickly right like round two is is robin versus tangu robin takes that guy out with a quickness right like the, these are kind of ancillary characters that don't really matter and are defeated incredibly fast and it's almost in a lot of ways damian wayne finding this kind of perfect balance between everything that batman had been teaching him and everything he learned as part of the league of assassins initially he is kind of stepping into his own right you can almost kind of hear the montage music as all this goes on. <laughs> it's a cool thing. But of course, one of the other parts of this is that Flatline rips out the heart of her opponent. And that's when Damian Wayne, who's observing all these people fighting and their fighting styles, comes to the realization that she only really seems to have one move, which is just ripping a person's heart out. That really seems to be it. But looking at everything else, right? XXL comes out on top. Drenched comes out on top. Ravager defeats her opponent, right? Like Connor Hawk takes his guy out. They all kind of come out on top. They do their own thing. That Black Swan, defeats her opponent as well. So we kind of know who's going to be fighting next. And so what we end up doing here is going into round three, right? Round one was when they first got on the island. Round two was really like this first part of the tournament. And then round three is now everybody else, right? The ones who were basically left over. And that's when the pairings are revealed, right? The right off the bat that what you have is you've got Robin versus Respawn, you've got Hawk versus XXL, and you've got Flatline versus Drenched. And when the fight breaks out, right? It's like everybody fight face off against your opponent, right? When the fight breaks out, Robin going after uh, Respawn is really more of a distraction than anything else. That in this instance, Robin basically runs, right? He goes and he leaps and Respawn, of course, launches his, his chained weapon, which hits Robin, but it basically knocks him down. But it wasn't really Robin's intention, right? As soon as he goes taking off running, he just books, right? He just immediately takes off. And where Respawn looks at what Robin is doing and he was like, why are you running away? The response of Robin is, I'm not running away. This was all part of my plan, right? To basically move in such a manner to where you would attack me and I could fail being hit by your attack, fly into Mother Soul, knock the book out of her hands, and then take it and literally run off with it, which is what he's doing here. And as he's going through it, what he says is that he has been studying Lazarus tattoos, the language itself, and learning how to read it. And he says there's something hidden within the pits, and it's more important than what she's planning. He says, I think I know who Mother Soul really is. The problem is that 
That's impossible. Whoever Mother Soul is, there's no conceivable way she can be alive. So here's what I wanna know. What are your theories on who Mother Soul is in this story? But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.